uh, Piro 314 um, made an interesting video on meditation. Um, a good one, actually. What um, interests me in that is the a line which I don't really think was central to his uh, point of his video. But the line was, um, he said, I don't believe that there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow when you meditate. Okay, that's an interesting statement. Um, it depends on what you mean by you don't believe that it's there. Um, is that you're going to assume that it isn't there and act on that assumption and forget having made that assumption? Or are you just sort of saying it's probably not there, but I won't rule it out? You've got to be careful about yes and no when you're dealing with your inner life because you get ambushed in there all the time <laughs> when you meditate stuff appears and you've got to be got to understand that the rules that take place up here or the rules that uh, you have to deal with in there are not the same rules as the outside world <laughs> it's not nice and predictable just the, the way that we've made the outside world very predictable for example um, the phenomenon of existential panic. Um, if you've ever had a particularly acute attack of anxiety or panic, you'll know what that is. You think your body's evaporating, you think the universe is going to evaporate, or you know, just some profoundly horrific experience that when you're in the middle of it, it's almost impossible to get out. Uh, it's been my experience that the only thing that sort of helps you with that is time and very <laughs> serious, tender, loving care of your own psyche. Um, and you go in, if you go into a situation where you may end up in a, in, a, in a state of existential panic, if you go in there with a completely rational, scientific um, outlook and you have not allowed for the massive amount of irration in here, illogic, unreason, um, if you haven't prepared yourself for that, then that monster of existential horror is just waiting to jump on you. Um, and you won't be ready when he does. Because <laughs> you'll just say, oh, this isn't real, this isn't real, this isn't real. It's just, I wonder what this is. This is fascinating. Um, I'm going to try and understand this uh, logically and reasonably and everything. <laughs> that monster in there is going to rip the rational side of you to shreds. Um, ask anybody who's just suffering from a long-term depression or a chronic anxiety who is perfectly rational, um, highly intelligent. Anybody that you know who suffers from panic or suffers from anxiety or depression or whatever that is otherwise extremely sane, very well grounded. Um, you can actually uh, almost make a correlation, I find, between high intelligence, or what looks like high intelligence, and anxiety and depression, etc. Um, your rational mind is not prepared for that. So if you sort of go, ah, it's not real, it's just a pile of nerve impulses, you're not really getting yourself in any state where you'd be capable of dealing with that monster when it arises. <laughs> um, for things like panic and anxiety, our faculties of reason are not always of any use at all uh, trying to deal with these things. You need the intuitive to deal with the monsters that you find down there locked in the dungeon of your own consciousness. So, in a sense, um, Zapfi's moment of panic in The Last Messiah is, in a sense, very real and a very real danger when you go inside. That's why they always tell you self-discipline. Don't get seduced by what you see down there. And if you think you're going close to a cage with a monster in it, approach with extreme caution and watch from all possible angles to see whether or not you're going to get ambushed in there when you're exploring your inner life. There's stuff in there that you're going to be terrified by. I always like, again, Orwell's 1984, Room 101, where the party knows exactly what everybody's worst thing in the world is by 
surveilling them for their entire life. Room 101 is already in here waiting for the party to, ex to exploit and use against you. So in that sense, I would say that yes, um, the negative, suffering, etc., has value. <laughs> um, now this is not to say that I'm <laughs> towing the line um, that's dangled by people like Gary. No, but I do believe that he's exploiting a lack of imagination or perhaps a lack of courage on many other people's parts who say that the good, not just the absence of bad, but the actual good exists. I, I'll admit that when I go inside my own inner life, when I go inside my own head to meditate for a while, I often have to treat it as something as, of a landmine, because, uh, uh, sorry, a minefield, because I know what's in there. Um, there are those, to sort of paint a picture, dark corners, very dark, where you see this big grate, an iron grate, heavy wrought iron grate, and behind that grate, behind that cage door, you hear the most profound roaring, gurgling, um, screeching, whatever horrible sounds you hear. And you'd better be careful when you approach that. <laughs> that version of that thing, whatever it is in your mind, it's there. And we don't always know what it is. We can't put a face on it. We can't put a name on it, but we know that it's there and it scares us. And when it overwhelms us, we if, if we're not prepared for it, it can be an extremely um, terrifying experience. In fact, I think it can af actually affect your mental health, possibly permanently. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but when you go looking around inside, when you go up, you know, you step up into the attic, there's stuff in there that you better be careful of. <laughs> um, now again, I'm, I'm just sort of belaboring that point because I'm just sort of saying, yeah, I know that it's all up there, all that bad stuff. But just, you know, again, use your reasoning or shift your perspective or do a little bit of a paradigm shift, even a provisional one. Okay, if there are, if there are these dark corners and cages and everything with growling beasts in them, metaphorically speaking, why shouldn't there be wonderful things that are not just the absence of this beast, but the actual presence of something that is the good, good, counterpart of that beast. What would be the counterpart of Zapfi's moment of existential panic when the caveman sees reality for what it is and then it kills him? What would be the opposite of that? How would we talk about that? How do you talk about a depression? How do you talk about anxiety to make people understand how bad you feel? It's uh, uh, The literature on both subjects is replete with... Um, frustration that you can't really explain to people who aren't depressed or aren't in a state of anxiety what it feels like. Well, it's equally difficult to talk about what a moment of existential joy would be like, how real that would look, how real that would be. It It's as real as the cage with the growling beast in it, but what is it? Well, like Room 101, we each have our own version of what it is, and we each have our own metaphors for describing what it is and what it actually plays out as in real life. I think that we've got to be careful by saying there is no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Because if we're saying that there is all this negative stuff, but no pot of gold, well, I think it's time for us to, you know, follow the Jane example of Salekana and starve ourselves to death. <laughs> because why would one, one want to exist in, in a horrific universe like this that has dreadful things like existential horror, but nothing on the positive side. The only thing that I would say is, <clears throat> it's all very well to sort of assume that there's no, I don't know, there's no actual counterpart to the horror of existence, to the darkness and the negative stuff that we see. You'd better understand what the implications of that are. <clears throat> um... Or you'd better actually put an equal amount of doubt on the bad stuff. That's not so easily done. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so I think that one might want to be a little bit careful by 
dismissing, or I don't even know if Pyro was dismissing this, but saying that, no, there is no payoff here. There is no positive. There's only ways to improve your health and put you back to um, a state of equilibrium or whatever. Now, again, we're using words here. It all depends on, again, what you think your default position is. If your default position is positive, then yes, okay, I get it. You remove all the negatives in life, and you deal with them, and what you've got left is good. It is actual goodness. Um, not just the absence of negative negativity. You've got a, you're in a positive state. You're in a plus. You're in a, uh, a surplus situation of goodness. Um, but what... You know, what does that mean to be in a surplus? What does that mean to be in the plus side of things? What does that mean to be in the exact opposite, the mirror image, the doppelganger of Room 101? What is that? We know what the negative things are. The negative seems to be a lot easier to portray, doesn't it? Eh? You know, when you see a picture of, um, of um, Gandalf from The Lord of the Rings facing off against... Um, I don't know, one of the Nazgul or, you know, one of the ring wraiths from the Lord of the Rings, your eye is automatically drawn to the ring wraith, isn't it? <laughs> you know, you, you see the bad guy. You want to look right at the bad guy. You're fascinated by the bad guy. Gandalf looks a bit boring, you know, in, in that circumstance. Why is that? Why is the mind drawn towards the bad? Why are our eyes drawn towards the ring wraith and we sort of think Gandalf is just a rather ordinary thing, ordinary fellow, when he's actually just as powerful as the ring wraith. Um, maybe it's that the bad stuff is far more obvious to us, um, because we assume that in some way it shouldn't be there, but it is there. Um, and I think that that reveals a weakness in our thinking. And I think it reveals a lack of courage, as I say in our thinking, or at least a lack of imagination. We think we can understand all the horrors of existence. What about all the anti-horrors of existence? I would say those things are obscured by the way that we approach these things. We approach these things with the scientific method, which relies on falsifiability, which experience is immune to. So we just say because you can't falsify something, it's irrelevant. It, we, you, I'm not saying that, that the scientific method says that, but it, it can result in that type of thinking. Over-reliance on the scientific method can do that. So I would be careful of things like, there is no pot of gold. <laughs> if there's no pot of gold, that's fine. As long as there's no dungeon with the howling beast behind those, those bars. Because if there's one there's the other. <laughs> Otherwise, time to go on a terminal diet.